And uh, if you would please, you'll be getting a, a handout for, you'll notice when you get your handout, this is uh, Exchatology part number 33, we are getting towards the end here, we're in Revelation chapter 21, and you'll notice it's entitled, It is Done. That is a misnomer, not a misprint, but a misnomer, because I was typing out that outline, that, it's not an outline, it's just a handout this morning, and I looked at that and I said, you know, I still have at least, at least, at least two more lessons I want to do after this, so it, this says it is done, but I'm not quite done yet, so um, there's a couple more things, I, we're in chapter 21, a couple more things I want to cover before we finish our series on eschatology. Um, and then uh, we'll be starting off a series on, the, on bibliology, talking about the Bible. And then after that, Lord willing, I mean, this is my, you know, the one I'm thinking how it's going to play through. And after that, a, uh, a, st a series of studies on um, um, the church, ecclesiology. And what I was, uh, you know, the, I guess the big plan that I had was to hit a lot of the... Um, the main topics of, of uh, theology, uh, theology all throughout the, this past year and this up and coming year. So I want to hit all the all the highlights. So we'll be talking about uh, probably uh, doctrine of the Holy Spirit coming up sometime this year, and also uh, and of course a lot of that of course going to cover you know the uh, the giving and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and, and uh, the, the uh, uh, talking about spiritual gifts and, and such as that. So there's a lot of a lot of topics we're going to hit. Uh, as we talk about uh, the series, and if you'll notice uh, all the outlines that we've had, I have that verse at the top there where it says, until I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. And so this is a general theme for the next uh, upcoming year for our Sunday school class, and that is some, some doctrinal um, studies. And so if you will, please, Revelation chapter 21 and uh, uh, verse number 6 through 8 is what I'm going to read, and uh, then we're going to be um, covering just a couple topics here this morning in reference to that. And so, and he said unto me, and of course this is uh, the Apostle John, and uh, he is on the island of Patmos. We have gone through, we have gone through all of this, and we're here now. Um, a lot of chapter 20, um, and uh, excuse me, a lot of chapter 21 and 22 uh, you know, the, the beginning of chapter 21 is talking about this, and then it goes back through and kind of recaps some of the things about uh, the millennial kingdom. And I mentioned that already, and that's not my intention this morning to talk about that. But uh, if you would, please, verse number 6 through 8. And he said unto me, um, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Uh, be there, uh, but the fearful and unbelievers and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And of course, he's talking about the lake of fire, which we've dealt with uh, several weeks back. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll get our Sunday school lesson started this morning. Father, I do want to thank you. It is such a joy to be able to assemble together this Lord's Day. I'm so thankful for all those that have come out to Sunday school class today. And Lord, the boys and girls are heading down, are headed downstairs and will receive a lesson this morning. So thankful for those that are willing to teach the young folks in our ministry. And I pray that you'd bless the time they spend together. And Lord, I just want to thank you for how good you have been to us in so many different ways and uh, the graciousness which we have received in our salvation through Jesus Christ and the promise of eternal life and, and the things that we um, have been reading about these, uh, these la this past year concerning the end times and yet the, the wonderful promise that you've given unto us that we, uh, we are overcomers and that we are not uh, subject to this wrath that we are, have been speaking about, but yet we're subject to all these great and precious promises and Father, I just want to thank you for the finished work of Jesus Christ and pray, Lord, that we would uh, greatly learn to appreciate that um, work that he's done for us uh, and also, Father, to be very mindful that many others need to, uh, need to hear this message uh, of, of saving grace 
And Lord, help us to be very bold and mindful, Lord, to present this message to those that we know and love. And thank you, Father, for this time together today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Well, this is where we're at. Um, of course, a new heaven, a new earth, and, and uh, we are, um, of course, have this great um, fulfillment of many promises, of course, throughout the scriptures. But uh, you know, Jesus says in, in, in verse number six uh, in our outline here, you'll, uh, or excuse me, this blank here, you'll see at the top there, he says in verse, uh, verse number six, he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega. We're going to focus most of our attention uh, this, uh, this afternoon on those phrases that are there, um, it is done. Um, when, we, when we see this phrase, it is done, uh, it's a, um, I don't want to, I, I hate to get technical uh, too often when it comes to wordage. Um, I, I love, when I'm, you know, when I'm studying for lessons and things like that, I'm always looking at words and definitions. Um, you know, if for some of the folks that are here, we had a, uh, we had a class um, a couple years ago, introductory to biblical Greek class. Uh, in our Bible Institute here, and so some of you were in that class, and so we, we talked about a lot of technical things in there. Uh, you don't have to be a Greek scholar to, to really appreciate the beautiful language that the Bible is written in both Old Testament, of course, in Hebrew and New Testament in Greek, uh, and there are so many tools and resources out there available. Uh, you know, you, it's old school, you know, we had to memorize so much stuff uh, just to get by, but nowadays the tools and the resources are so readily available. Um, you know, one, of the, one of the characteristics about uh, a phrase like that, that you see right there where Jesus says, it is done, uh, is the tense that it's written in. You know, um, I'm no English scholar. As a matter of fact, um, when I was going through Bible college, of course, I took all the Greek classes I possibly could and the Hebrew classes that were available. And I think I learned more about the English language during that time uh, than I'd ever appreciated before because I was, I was a horrible student going through high school. And so um, um, I still butcher the Queen's English most of the time anyway. Uh, ain't that right? But um, we, we see that the, 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 the tense that this is written in, it's, it's, called, it's called a perfect tense. And, um, you know, of course, we're familiar with things like past tense and present tense and future tense, and that, those are wonderful um, basic tenses. And I think we all appreciate what they mean to say something is past tense, but a, um, a perfect tense um, in, in the language of the Bible uh, is that uh, this is written in that tense, which indicates something that has been completed, okay? So like past tense, it's been completed, but a perfect tense means, means it's perfectly completed. You get the idea? So that is something that, that will never need to be repeated again. So if it's in perfect tense, that means it's done, and it's done done. Not just regular old done, but complete, never has to be done. It's like, a, it's like a once and for all type of statement. And that's a fantastic um, understanding of what, what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying here when he says it is done. Uh, complete it, never has to be done again. It's kind of like if you were, you, know, you were to say to your parents and said, Are the, did you wash the dishes? And you would say, yes, I washed the dishes. It's done. Well, is that done done? Tomorrow, will there be dirty dishes? Probably, yeah. It's kind of like laundry, you know. Mom goes through and gets all the laundry done. And then the next day, what happens? You take your socks off. Ah! All right? Same day. Glory. It's true. Could you? <laughs> anyway, we're going to get some theology going now. All right, so think about this in reference to this work that Christ has done because it's not something that he has done that he's going to have to ever have to do again. So you think about what is all done. God has dealt with, finally dealt with sin and the, sin, and the results of sinfulness. He has dealt with the, the, um, the, the, the world as far as the contamination uh, from the very moment that Adam and Eve set, sinned in the garden and this contamination of sin spread like a virus all throughout the world and, and ruined God's perfect creation. And um, the, uh, the necessity of dealing with that, we see all the judgments. So what we see in this statement when Jesus said it is done, he is talking about the completeness of everything that was necessary 
to, um, to finally deal with the whole purging of the results of sin. Now, there are a couple other instances that we see in the scriptures where this, especially with this perfect tense is mentioned, in reference to something being finished. Now, let's just throw this out there. Can you think of an instance where we see a statement about completion or, or something that's finished? And on the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ. Go, go with me to that passage of Scripture. It's in John, um, it's in John chapter 19. And, uh, and you'll see this statement. Of course, Christ is on the cross, and the crucifixion is taking place. In John chapter 19, and verse number 30, specifically, and Jesus therefore had received the vinegar. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, what did he say? It is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. Now, you'll never guess what tense that term, it is finished, is written in. Any, any guesses? Perfect tense. Very good guess, all right? It's written in the perfect tense. And so, again, it's that tense of once and for all. It's done, it's completed, never has to be repeated again. So when Jesus says it's finished, uh, what he's talking about, he's certainly not talking about his life, like, I'm, you know, I'm done for now. He is speaking about this completed work uh, that was necessary for the redemption of sin. It's a finished work of salvation. That is such an important doctrine in the scriptures, the finished and complete work of salvation. Now, that is not a doctrine that a lot of people, a lot of churches buy into. And I'm not saying they, they diminish what Christ has done, but they, they neglect the fact that everything that is necessary for salvation uh, has been done. So, for instance, those that believe in what we would call a works based salvation, uh, kind of miss the fact of the finished work of Christ. So that's why we see scriptures like, you know, uh, for by grace you saved through faith and that not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Um, this idea of, uh, of understanding that, that, the, that, that salvation, the work of salvation, the, the, what was necessary for salvation to be to be um, available has already been completed. So there's absolutely nothing that you can do. And that's, a, that's a, such an important doctrine because there, you know, when I look at religions on a, on a kind of a bigger scale, I, they kind of fall into basically two categories. You know, the religions that believe in the finished work of Christ, that is salvation by faith and faith only, and religions that believe that, you, that is, there is something else that's required. So whether it be, for instance, a sacramental system where you've got to do this and do that, and you've got to continue to do this, there's, you know, penance that has to be made, you know, where you have to, you know, either say prayers or do good deeds or something in order to receive forgiveness, in order to maintain or gain or maintain your salvation. That is, that is not a it is finished mentality. That is a continual working of salvation. Or you have religions that require, you know, certain... Uh, certain activities, you know, you got to come out, you got to do the door knocking, you got to do this, you got to, you know, you got to be in services. If you're not coming to services, then you're not going to go to heaven. It's, you have to join our religion in order to have salvation. And, um, you know, Baptists do not have, um, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're not the only ones that teach the only way, but the only way that what we teach is the only way. So, Salvation does not come because you're a member of a Baptist church. Okay, if that was the case, then the finished work of Christ was, uh, was, was not really finished. If we're the ones who divvy out salvation. Um, it's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and him only. Nothing added. No works. No, um, uh, you know, um, uh, no association with any organization in order to gain or maintain that salvation. Uh, nothing that you could ever possibly do. So when we talk about finished work, go with me, if you would, please, to Hebrews chapter 10. It is one, a, a, a really favorite passage of Scripture of mine in Hebrews chapter 10. I've read this, I don't know, countless times here um, during my preaching over the years. 
<clears throat> Hebrews chapter 10. I'll start in verse number 10, Hebrews 10, 10. Um, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every pre- and he makes it, then he goes back and he makes the parallel. Um, I shouldn't say the parallel. He, he makes the, um, the comparison to the Old Testament priests. And every priest standing daily ministering and offering oft times the same sacrifice, which can never take away sin. And, uh, of course, it's, you know, it's the book of Hebrews, so the author of the book of Hebrews is writing to a Hebrew, a Jewish audience who is very familiar with this, and they would have gone to the temple and, and seen this day, I'm literally day after day after day, and animals are being brought in, the, and they're being killed right there in front of them. They're putting their hands on the animals, identifying their sin with that animal, and that sin is, uh, that, that animal's being killed, and the blood's being shed and taken, sprinkled. The animal is, is pushed on, put on an altar, and it's burned, and that smoke constantly going up. Could you imagine being in Jerusalem and seeing that, that, that smoke going up from the, um, from the uh, brazen altar? endlessly, day after day. And um, please get the, get the picture in your mind of the, um, of the temple in Jerusalem. And it was, it was a big place, and the courtyard was, was massive. Um, and just the amount of animals coming through there. If you've ever been around, um, you know, um, uh, so, uh, some of you hunt, and so... You know, you've butchered animals before, you know, by hand. Um, Brother Danny, I remember going over uh, Don's house in the basement, and uh, we butchered, they're, they're, you guys butchered a lot of animals. Uh, he, he, they used to hang them on the back, and he had a tree in his backyard there, and we'd hang, the, hang them up there, and then we'd drag them down the basement, and he had a really nice big table down there. Your brother Jeff, he, he owned the grinder, didn't he? Okay. And so uh, they'd butcher them right there. They'd quarter the deers, and they'd have the grinder there to make the, make the hamburger. And, and so um, it was just, I mean, there's blood everywhere, and, and you just never thought about it. You just kind of did it. Um, but um, could you imagine being around that constantly, day after day? I mean, it's kind of grotesque when you think about it, but the purpose of that was to remind everyone of the severity of sin. That's what it was for. It was the point attention to what actually sin has done. And it was necessary. And they saw it every single day. And it never ended. And even the celebration of the Passover when they, when they killed a lamb, and they brought it in and had it killed. And they took, of course, they took the lambs home and ate them. Um, but they ever, it was year after year after year. And the, and the Day of Atonement was the same thing. When they, it was the most holy day of the Jewish calendar. And they'd come in, they would, they would slay this, the animal. They have a scapegoat also that was put out in the wilderness. But they would they'd kill this animal. And it was, it was being identified as a collective sin of the whole nation of Israel. And, uh, and the, you know, the, the, the high priest takes the blood into the Holy of Holies and sprinkles the blood on the mercy seat. But it happened every year. It never ended. And that's what Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 11. Yes? Oh, yeah. Just so they could see, I mean, every time they could understand how serious their sin it was because of their, it, it's kind of like, Deb, just think about it this way, okay? Because of your sin, this animal has to die. Okay? You got a favorite pet? You got a favorite pet? Yeah? Okay. Think about this. Could you imagine taking something that's precious to you and it would die because of your sin? Okay? Yeah. Yeah. It, it was it was it was it was supposed to hit home. It was supposed to make people stop and think that that my sin has caused this. And uh, I mean, it was it was purposeful. Now it never removed the sin. What it did was it deferred the punishment. It constantly deferred the punishment. And and the with, where 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 salvation would come in for those that were Jewish. 
was the fact that they would, have, they would put their faith in trusting what God has said. I am going to do what God says I should do, and I'm going to trust that he will forgive me of my sins. It's not the action or the work that does it. It was always, always based on faith of believing God. And, and so, but the thing is, it never ended. And God told him, this is never going to end. Uh, until Messiah comes. And so, yes, sir? It would happen. Now mm -hmm. we believe that it did happen, right? Yes. It already happened for us, but they had to believe like, that it would be future tense. That, that is correct, happen. yeah. And, you know, it's, and it's hard for us to really get a grasp on that because we live so far on this side of the cross. And uh, I'm, to, be, to be honest with you, it seems like it's easier for us to put faith in something that has already happened than it would have been to put faith in something that was anticipated to happen. And, and so, you know, it's hard for us to get a grip on what it really meant to put faith in that. But it was still required. It has always been, uh, it is, God's salvation has always been a salvation based on faith. And we, you know, classic example in the book of Hebrews in chapter 13 where it talks about, you know, by faith. Excuse me, chapter 11, uh, where it talks about faith. You know, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And we, we see this, this work of faith there um, that required no, no, um, no work in order to bring about salvation, but we see the result of their salvation um, based on what they did. Um, so what we see here, and we're in Hebrews chapter 10, and I just got hung up on verse number 11. Look at verse number 12. But this man, and that's talking about Christ, after he had offered, please notice what it says, one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. What a great, tremendous verse of Scripture. Because that, what that does is it removes so much of man's religion immediately. Because so much of what man's religion is, is trying to, to finish the work of salvation in, in some way, shape, or form. You, you need to do this. You need to accept this. You need to be involved in this. You need to receive this. Uh, you know, whether it be, a, you know, some kind of sacrament or something like that. And, and so, you know, I, I certainly do believe if somebody gets saved, they ought to be baptized, okay? But does baptism save anybody? And so, you know, to, this, you know, to, to believe that you have to do, you know, some kind of religious activity in order to gain salvation, it screams right in the face of that verse of Scripture. I mean, one sacrament, it was done. And to tell somebody that, you know, here, well, you've, you, well, you say, you know, you've gotten saved, whatever, however their salvation message is, but now you've sinned, and so in order to get saved again or maintain your salvation or regain your salvation, you need to do, and that is so far from what the Bible teaches. And so, you know, when Jesus was on the cross and he said, it's finished, when he shed his blood and he died on the cross, it completed the work of salvation forever. And so in order to have salvation, there is nothing you need to do. By faith, you receive it. It is the gift of God. It's not of works. And so... And it's through the Lord Jesus Christ we receive salvation by faith. It's a great truth. And so it's wrapped up in that one phrase that we see Christ saying on the cross, and it's finished. It, it's done. It, it's like all expense paid, right? I mean, you've probably seen some things before where they, you know, offer, you know, something and you think it's for free, and then you find out you kind of missed the small print, you know? Um, well, there's, there's, no, there's no small print here. It's, it's it. It's a done deal. It's a great truth. Now, I want to mention also, uh, go back with me to Revelation chapter 16. Revelation 16. And so, um, we're, you know, we're talking about this phrase, it is done. And Revelation 16, we see something very similar 
um, in, um, let's see here. Yeah, Revelation 16 and verse number 17. And it says here, and the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great noise out of the temple uh, of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. And, and again, we see this statement, and you'll notice that it's, um, please notice the, uh, the what angel we got going on here, okay? So what's, what would be significant about the fact it's the, the seventh, it's the angel with the seventh vial, okay? Completion. Not necessarily by the number, okay, but it is, you know, number seven is usually an indication of completion in the scripture, okay? I'm not big into numerology, but that's truly what the Bible indicates. Uh, what, what's going on with the vials? How, how many sets of judgments are there, divine judgments in the scripture? Okay, there's 19. What's that? Some, some open up to other judgments. Right, so there's, there's, three, there's three sets of seven is what it comes down to, okay? So you have the seven seals. And you have the seven trumpets, and then you have the seven vials. Okay, and so, um, so the, you know, the seven seals. They, you know, we we going back here like the the, four, the horsemen back here. Um, you know, when they start opening up the scroll, when you got the seven seals, and after that's then the seven trumpets, and then you have the seven vials are being poured out. And this is so. This is the last of the series of of seven. And so, when the last one is poured out, you have that statement. It's finished. So, you know, is it different than what Christ says in, in of course, in further in Revelations where we're at? Yo, very much different. Um, what we're talking about is the completion of the divine judgments of God. And, and so we see um, there, are, there, are, there are other judgments, of course, in the Scriptures, and we, we know that certainly is true, but we see very specifically these three, these um, seven um, groups, um, three groups of seven uh, throughout the book of Revelation. And so what has been now completed is the, um, this, um, this divine judgment that God is extending uh, onto the world where he's inflicting this wrath. Um, of course, some of it's uh, a lot greater wrath than others, but inflicting this wrath. And of course, was it uh, back in chapter, uh, uh, chapter 6 <clears throat> in Revelation, you do see a separation uh, between... Uh, some of the judgments in a more a more wrathful type judgment. Some people define it as as earthly judgments as compared to uh, heavenly judgments. And there's a lot of different expressions that people try to use in order to do that. <clears throat> and all those uh, pre-wrath rapture type of folks try to define it too and put the rapture in the middle of all that. Um, I, I don't buy into that myself. But um, but we see this this idea that God has um, poured out all of His divine wrath uh, upon the world at this time, and now, um, for, you know, from that portion, there's scripture in Revelation chapter 17, then there's visions about Babylon the Great, and visions about the falling of the one world uh, system, and all these visions, and then we come to this point in time where we get all the way up to chapter 19, where Jesus Christ now returns, and so, uh, so we, we see that God has points in time where um, things are um, things are brought to a point where he says, "Now this is done." So, for instance, you know, on the cross, the work of salvation was done. Um, when the seventh, the last of the seventh vials was poured out, he says, "This this part is done." Uh, and now, now we're over here, and he finally says, "It's finished. Now we're we're completely done." And, and so, there are stages where God is coming along and saying, there, there are certain things that we need to finish, and this is now finished. And then when he gets to the very end, he's, he says, we're done. This is, this is it. Everything now is done. So the finished work is completed. The divine judgments are done. Um, the, complete, the, the finished work of salvation is done. The divine judgments are done. We get to the end of Revelation. Now he says, we are completely done. Everything is completed at this point. So go back to our text there in chapter 21. Now, I do want to say there's, there's quite a bit uh, of text left, okay? And um, I, as I mentioned weeks ago, um, I do believe that there is a transition from verse number, beginning of verse number 9 of that, of that chapter, verse chapter 21, 
that runs through the beginning of chapter 22, and really verse number 5, where it, I believe, goes back and speaks about um, the millennial kingdom in the temple being here, um, excuse me, the city of Jerusalem during the millennial kingdom. And we talked about that, talked about uh, the fact that there's, uh, in, uh, there's still sin and sinful folks, and they're not having access to the city. And so that is certainly millennial-type passages. And so there's a lot of text here. So when it says at the beginning of this chapter, it's finished, yes, there's a lot of the book. There's, you know, got almost two chapters left. So uh, there's some things that we're certainly going to talk about. But I want to talk about one of the things that's mentioned here in this particular verse of Scripture. And again, uh, chapter, uh, um, let me see here, where am I at? Chapter 21 and verse number, uh, verse number 6 again. And he says, um, he said unto me, it is done, I am Alpha and Omega. I want to talk a little bit about that term, Alpha and Omega, okay? Um, of course, um, Alpha and Omega are um, part of the Greek alphabet. If you're not familiar with the Greek alphabet, it's a little bit different than ours. Uh, not a whole lot, just a couple letters different, but uh, characters are cool looking. Um, if you have math classes, you know, you used a lot of those characters in math, all right? So, uh, you know. Everybody knows what pi is, right? Oh, man, Mrs. Shorter made this pineapple upside down cake yesterday. It was in a pie shape. Oh, man, I did some math yesterday with that pie. All right, did some subtracting. Anyway, um, so, um, so th characters like pi, that's part of, the, uh, a part of the Greek alphabet. Alpha, of course, is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. And omega, of course, is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. And so... So he's using that. So I don't know if they're, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting that he's using that here. But um, um, we see that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is, is, is making a comment here in reference to his character. I am Alpha and Omega. So beginning and end. Um, he, he says, of course, in, in that particular verse of Scripture, again, verse number 8, um, excuse me, verse number six, he says, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Now, that term itself is used several times um, uh, in the scriptures. Um, matter of fact, um, if, you, if you look at, if you just search the, the phrase itself, uh, I believe it's four times just in the book of Revelation, you'll see Alpha and Omega, the term Alpha and Omega used. Now, that term beginning and end you're going to find in some other places also. And, uh, and so when you think about the Lord Jesus Christ um, in reference to beginning and end, um, let's be reminded, first of all, that he was the one who began all things. For instance, um, you know, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, uh, you know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word, talking about Jesus Christ, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, talking about Christ. And without him was not anything made that was made. Uh, take, take your Bibles and go with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 48. Isaiah, chapter 48. Take a look at a few verses of Scripture here. Uh, verse 12 and 13, Isaiah 48, verse number 12, that says this, Hearken unto me, O Jacob. And Israel, my called, I am he, I am the first, I am the last. My hand hath laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand hath spammed the heavens. When I called unto them, they stand up together. This is a, a statement concerning the fact that God is the creator of all things, and he identifies himself as the first and the last. Uh, and so um, this is exactly, this is exactly what Jesus is claiming in the book of Revelation. I am the Alpha and Omega. I am the beginning. I am the last. I am uh, beginning and the end. I am the first and the last. He said that, he uses those words specifically a little bit further on the Revelation. But you'll see the, um, the statement here. So Old Testament claiming um, the first and last here, but also this idea of, uh, of course, the statement concerning his, the, his creation, but we see it reiterated again in the New Testament, specifically directed towards the Lord Jesus Christ and making that comparison, Old Testament, New Testament comparison, 
that Jesus Christ is the beginning of all things. He's the one who started everything that we see in this world today. He's the creator. But he's also, of course, as it says there in Isaiah, he's also the last in the fact that he will be there at the end. I just want to, I want to read one verse, and, and we're going to keep moving on here, but Acts chapter 10, in verse number 42, um, speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ, and he hath commanded us to preach unto the people, this is Acts 10, 42, and to testify that it is he, talking, this is Paul, excuse me, yeah, the Apostle Paul, talking about Jesus Christ, that it is he which, uh, which was ordained, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 10, that is Peter, that was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead, the living and the dead. And we see that the Lord Jesus Christ will be there at the end. He is the one who is going to be the judge of all things. It's interesting that the day of the Lord, of course, is defined um, speaking about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the day of the Lord is also defined as that time of judgment for the whole world where everything comes to a conclusion and all, everything is, you know, we, we used that term a long time back. We talked about the day of the Lord. And so, um, you know, it's always used as a time of judgment. You know, I've got to add something to the board today. Let's see here. I've got to have an alpha and omega, like, way over here somewhere, okay? So, so uh, and I'm running out of space. So let me see here. There's my alpha, and there's my omega. How's that look? All right, not too bad. All right. Anyway, so um, Jesus is the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega, and he will be there at the end to judge all things. And so he is, it's like when all the dust settles, right, there's Jesus. Um, he is the beginning of all things. He's the end of all things. Now this is, of course, that term is mentioned several times. Go back with me to the Revelation. And um, as I said, it's mentioned, out, the term Alpha and Omega is, is mentioned four times um, in the book of Revelation. Uh, the first time it's mentioned is Revelation chapter 1. If you just turn over there real quick, Revelation chapter 1. Please notice uh, verse number 8. Um, of course, John is uh, there on the island. He begins to see this vision. The Lord Jesus Christ appears to him uh, in, a, in this vision, this revelation. And Jesus says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Oh, my. That's a big statement right there, especially when he adds that term, the Almighty. And so he is claim this is a claim of divinity, of course, um, you know, being the beginning and the end. So there are some people that have this idea, you know, Jesus had an, you know, first and last. He had an origin, he'll have an end. That's not what it's saying at all. He was there at the beginning, and he will be there at the end. Uh, and he claims, this is a claim of divinity, where he says, I am the Almighty. That's that, you know, it's like the Lord God omnipotent reigneth type of statement that Jesus Christ is making concerning himself. Uh, uh, if you would please um, keep your place here in Revelation, but go back with me again to the book of Isaiah, this time Isaiah chapter 44 and verse number 6. Again, this is, these are statements um, paralleling this, this, um, um, this concept, the statements of being first and last or alpha and omega. Isaiah chapter 44 and verse number 6, Thus saith the Lord, uh, the King of Israel, and his, uh, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am first, and I am last, and besides me there is no God. And what's interesting that we have this Lord, um, King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. Now, again, you know, we believe in one God, but we certainly do believe in, in, in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That is, that is not, not, you know, polytheism. We do not believe in three gods. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. <coughs> Shema Israel, Adonai Elohenu, Adonai Echud. Okay? I love that word. And, and so there, we believe in one God. And so it is, it's, it's, there's nothing wrong with this statement talking about, you know, the Lord the King and then the, and, and then the Lord the Redeemer. It's not like we got two separate things going on, but 
we do have two persons, and yet the statement is so clear when it says at the end of that statement, there is, uh, and besides me, there is no God. There's only one God. And we find them in the, we find that in the Lord Jesus Christ, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. And so when we get to the book of Revelation and he makes that statement to John, uh, John the Apostle, uh, when he says, you know, I am, I am Alpha and Omega, and he calls himself the Almighty, he is claiming deity. He is claiming to be divine, and he certainly is. He is the, he is the, the divine God of the Old Testament as defined in the book of, Revel, uh, in the book of Isaiah. Uh, go with me back to Revelation. Let's go to, again, cha- you're in chapter 1, and uh, <coughs> another statement a little bit further in this revelation uh, to John in verse number 11. Uh, again, he's continuing to talk to John. He says, saying, uh, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto uh, Smyrna and unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira and unto Sardis and unto Philadelphia and unto Laodicea. And, and so here, here we see this, uh, again, the Lord Jesus Christ, he's, he makes a statement about being Alpha and Omega, and it's interesting that he ties this now in to this extending of this revelation, in other words, communicating this truth to others. He, he makes the statement that he is the first and the last. He is he's, um, the beginning and the end. So what I, what, I, what, what I see in this particularly is that... Um, is that we have this we we have this um, um, revelation being given by Jesus Christ, saying I want you to I want you to write these things to these folks. Jesus says I'm I'm the beginning on the end. In other words, I, I'm I've been I, I've been here throughout the entire creation. I understand everything that's going on. Now please notice when when John is getting this revelation, the end hasn't happened yet. So Jesus is claiming to be the God who's going to be at the end. And so if anybody can tell us what's going to happen at the end, I mean, it's only going to be God. It's not like he's some kind of prophet getting these, you know, I'm talking about Jesus. It's not like he's some kind of prophet just kind of getting these visions, trying to sort these things out. You know, it's like not a Nostradamus type of of experiment here. He is God. (laughs) He sees the beginning and he sees the end, and he knows how it all plays through. He says, I want you to write these things down. I want you to tell people what is going to happen. Not what he thinks is going to happen, what might happen. And we get, you know, I I suppose we get a lot of uh, what ifs and maybes, and this might play through this way. And I'll be honest with you, there's a lot of things I don't completely understand about all the end time things. And, and I've told you, as we've gone through some of this stuff, this is what I think is going to, what this means and what I think that means. So I, I'm, I'm not dogmatic about everything that I understand about the end of things, okay? But I know Jesus is. He knows exactly how it plays through because he's the alpha and he's the omega. So he knows exactly how this thing plays through. Please notice, drop down a few verses. In, uh, take a look at verse number 17. And when I saw this, I fell at his feet. This was an angel, of course. It is, uh, um, I'm sorry, that, now the angel thing happens later on. I beg your pardon. And when I saw this, I fell at his feet as, uh, as dead, his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and, uh, and death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. And, uh, and so his intention, of course, is communication. You know, for, for, the, for the Lord Jesus Christ to appear to John, I mean, that's a tremendous thing, but the purpose was communication. He says, I don't want you to be fearful. I want you to communicate. And this is a, this, just that fact itself should be an encouragement to us not to be fearful. The Lord Jesus Christ is communicating with us. as Through John, through the writings, of course, we had in the book of Revelation and many other places in reference to prophecy, 
But the Lord Jesus Christ is communicating to us so that we do not have to face the end times with fear. We don't have to worry. We know exactly how this thing plays through. You know, I, I enjoy reading uh, a lot of books and things like that. You know, I'm, I'm not a gigantic reader, but I do enjoy reading books. There are sometimes you read books that they, people make movies out of. And, uh, and so, you know, there, there have been a few times where I've, I've watched a movie that I've already read the book, you know. And, uh, and you know, it's, it's okay, but you already know how it plays through. You know, you're watching a movie, and you could probably be telling the person next to you, let me tell you what's going to happen next. And they smack. It's like, just shut up. Just try to watch a movie. All right? So, you know, to have a full understanding of how the thing plays through is a tremendous thing. And, you know, uh, we live in, you know, a time and age, you know, uh, probably every generation has this, has a moment like this, you know, where they're thinking like, you know, we're living in a day and age that has never, and, okay, I mean, they said the same thing in 19, you know, 44, you know, and, um, and to repeat it, generation after generation, and yeah, we do, we, I mean, every generation has particular stages in time where it's like, this is just the craziest thing. It's never been like this before, okay? Um, and that may be true. But, you know, we serve a God that knows how this thing plays through. He knows the end. And I, you know, I'm not worried about it. You know, I'm not thrilled about how things played through, especially with the election and things like that. I was talking to somebody a couple, uh, couple months ago and we were talking about elections and things like that, and I said, well, you know, and they weren't even old enough to remember when Bill Clinton ran for president. And I said, I said, it's a, I said the same stuff that's being said today is the same stuff that was being said when Bill Clinton ran for president. You know, if he wins, everything is in the, it's the end of the world. It's going to be horrible. And then after he had his second term and... Um, let me see, that would be yeah, Bush uh, Jr. Um, I, re I remember all the stuff saying, well, I, you know, I've heard, I think this, I think we had a World Wide Web by then. Anyway, I heard online that Bill Clinton, he's going he's gonna to declare martial law, and he's not going to leave the White House, and it's going to be horrible. There's going to be war breaking out. Wow, that sounds really familiar, doesn't it? Anyway, so it's like, Plus c'est chant, plus c'est le manchant. That's my French. Pretty good? The more the things change, the more they stay the same. Okay? And I'm not worried about it. Because I know that Jesus Christ, he's got, he knows the end. He's the Alpha and the Omega. And my confidence is not in any political system. It's not in any man. My confidence is in Christ. And... That's, that's enough for me. I'm not worried about it. My confidence in Christ removes fear. And when he, when he says to John, write these things down, do not be fearful. Write these things down. Send them to the churches. Let them know what's going to happen. And uh, that's a great thing. Um, you know, confidence uh, of knowing how things play through is what the Lord Jesus Christ intends when, and in the beginning of the book of Revelation, when he declares himself to be Alpha and Omega. But when we get to the end of the book of Revelation and he makes those declarations, please go back with me there, back with me to Revelation chapter, let's go to chapter 22, because we see again the statement concerning that in chapter 22. And look at verse number 12 and 13. He said, and be, and behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And again, this is, you know, he makes the statement again. It's the fourth time it's used in the book of Revelation. But he makes the, state, the statement again in reference to his character being first and last, but this time he makes it in direct relationship to the reward. You know, it's like when, when, when it's all done, when all the dust settles, when everything is completed, there's Jesus. And he is there to, my reward is with me. In other words, you're my children, 
you put your faith in, and Christ is saying, you put your faith in me, and it, it, it's, it's not in vain. Everything that what Christ is telling us, everything that I have promised you is going to be done. Everything. And, and so this is a, I mean, this is a great promise that we have that Christ will be there. He was, he was at the beginning when everything was created. And when it's all said and done, he's going to be he's going to be there at the end. And because of your faith in him, not in anything else, but your faith in him, um, you will be there with him. And that is a great promise. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And there is no other God besides him. Well, we've got a couple more lessons in our Sunday school in the book of Revelation, so we'll, uh, this, this says it is done, and it certainly is not. We, uh, Lord bless you. Thanks for being in Sunday school today.